let's hope that, that recording actually works. So let's start off with just a brief um, review of what we were talking about last time. So we're working through the Julia programming language. One of the very important things we worked on, first kind of thing, was Hello World. You can print to a screen with the function println. Can you guys see that all right? Okay. Yeah. Worked on functions. So this is the syntax for a function. You have you declare first thing, this is a function. You name the function, got a space in between there, no spaces in the function name, and then inside of parentheses, you have your parameters. This function only has one parameter. You can print a number, and then we print this using the print function instead of println, syntax errors, math, all good there, pretty similar to just paper and pencil math. Um, value comparison, so we have the equal equal operator that checks the, the values on the left and right of it, um, which then leads into Booleans, which are trues and falses. Um, we had some example functions using all of this kinds of stuff. Control flow, so with Booleans, we're able to figure, we can go into different directions in our code and do different things based on what is called state. So the state of this function when you pass in true, um, this parameter says, hey, if I'm gonna give the discount and you pass in true, you go into there. So we're going to see similar kinds of things for our loops tonight where we're using control flow to continue going through the loop. Uh, we saw how to use Booleans, all the, all the logic there. Um, so ands, ors, um, equal equals, that kind of stuff. So are there any questions from the first time that you kind of got through and ran through but would like a deeper explanation on? Great. So let's go into module two. So module two, that might be the one that you opened up already. But so the good thing about this, I guess I'll just do this now, some of the stuff I was going to show. So in this Jupyter Lab binder, whatever you want to call it thing, at the end of the day, it is just all a file system. You have access to all the files that are in the repository. Um, so you can go up and down. You can go into these modules, um, which you'll need to navigate around. Um, you can also, so we're usually working in these, the, the, the lecture material, we'll say, is in these things called Jupyter Notebooks. But you can also use regular Julia files. And I'll, we'll get there in a, at the end of this. But like there are files where you know you write actual Julia code. Like you have all, it sounds like, seen some amount of code in your lives. And it's not in these Jupyter Notebooks. It's in regular kind of script or code files. So this will be our first one that we're going to do later on, but just giving a heads up there. So this is our um, module number two. What we're doing here are loops, arrays um, in mathematical nomenclature, and actually in Julia, it's called a vector. So a list of things and series, a mathematical series. Um, so a loop, does anybody know what a loop does? Um, I'm getting some head nods. It's a way of doing the same thing many times. So in this example that I have here, we have the for loop. Um, this is the syntax to do what this is doing. So this is a bad way of doing it above, which would be, hey, I want to print the word print hello five times. So you just copy and paste a bunch of times. That's not sustainable. You're not going to be able to build abstract functions that way. But a for loop, you can say, hey, I have this one thing I want to do. I'd like to do it multiple times. So the syntax for a for loop is, and I've kind of got it down here, but you have for, so it's like for the thing that I'm doing, for the thing that I provide you, um, for each one, so we're, you just name some variable here, um, and it's declared there, in, and then something that's called an enumerable, something that you can iterate over, so a list of things. And what this syntax is doing is it's just giving you a range of numbers between one and five, and that's inclusive. So one, two, three, four, five. And then it's going to, for each of those, print um, each time through the loop. So it's going to, first it's going to go in, the first value of i is going to be one. It's going to print hello world. It's going to go to the end and see, okay, you know, I haven't made it to the fifth one yet, so I'm going to do this again and again and again each time through. So I'll go ahead and run this. Go ahead. Can you use anything for that variable i? Yeah, I could change right now. I could change this to x. I could change this to. Did you have the entire phrase? 
index of this loop. In general, yeah, you variable names are as long and as descriptive as you want them to be. I is just um, a well-known shorthand for writing index. So you'll often see when people, if, if, the, if the variable is nothing other than an index, you'll see I, J, and then whatever other variables people want to use um, if they're use, using loops or loops inside of loops. Um, and in my opinion, unless you're doing a mathematical formula where you have it documented right above, you should never use a one letter um, variable name unless it's an index. So. Does um, Jupyter not recognize I as square root of negative one? No, it doesn't. I think it has like a fancy script I okay. way of doing it, um, a, some sort of Unicode character. Um, but no, I imagine they probably thought about it for about five seconds because they do like Unicode and like using those. But they're like about a thousand percent of code has a for loop with a, the letter I as the index variable in it. So we probably shouldn't make that equal to negative one um, or the square root of negative one rather. Okay, so that's a loop. So now let's do something slightly different. So you can already start to see that you could do mathematical series with these. So I have a series right here. So where we're just taking the sum of the indices. So from I equals one to 10, sum the indices. So that's this exact same thing. So we have some variable that we're gonna put our summation value into. We're gonna go over the loop. We're gonna do it for every value one through 10. And we're going to take the value as we have it. We're going to add i to it and put that back into that same variable. So it's like just adding each successive term. And then we're printing it out. And it already printed out. Um, so you can see, we can see it at each index. So, and I, I'll re I want to review this syntax because it might be a little confusing. When you put a dollar sign with parentheses in Julia inside of a string, it will evaluate the variable and turn it into a string. So we're passing a number inside. So you can, when you click on it, actually here, it changed to green. It's letting you know that this is going to evaluate. So this is, in other languages, you'd see like a dot two string is what this is doing. It's calling a two string function on whatever object you're passing into it. Um, yeah, go ahead. And just to confirm, if you didn't have the print ln line, would it not automatically output anything at all? Yeah, so if I put, you're saying if I got rid of that yeah, and output. and that, yeah, it's going to do nothing. It's just, it did it. It did all this stuff, but there was nothing to print. So now if I was to, let's see if it'll let me, it doesn't let me add another one. So if I then, you can, so it's actually keeping all of these variables in there um, in like in memory. So you can actually, I never do. Everything I do in these in these chunks of code, I make sure they're all discrete. But you can actually like build up stuff throughout the notebook. Um, so if you ever see that or you're getting a weird result, like sometimes it's worth like just clearing the the state of the whole thing, which you can do um, with this button right here. Restart the kernel and it'll get rid of everything. Um, but if I was to run but this it now, the, it treats the I value that you're using for the print hello world loop. Separately from this i value that you're using for the summation of. Say that. Say that again. But you're using i for both the summation um, loop and also for the hello world loop. So it treats those i's individually. So yes, that's because it's being when you put it here, you're redeclaring it. Okay. Um. And you're setting it. So you could think of it as inside the first first line of the first index, it's going to do that. So it doesn't matter. We could have i equals to 15 here, and it won't matter because each time through the loop, it's going to assign i to a new value. But if you left i equals 1. I can do this right here. And it, oh, well, we, I need to get rid of i got to get my print statements back. Those will be helpful. Ah. Too far. Too far. So if I was to make this i equal 15, we're still going to get the same result because it did what it? If you just left i equals one in the summation. Yeah, if you used in this part. Yeah. Yeah. So now you're gonna get. Would it print two? What do you What do you think this is gonna? Um, what do you think the value of this at the end will be? Two. At the end of the first, yeah, after of the no of the of the whole loop. Two. That's right there. Fifteen. Should be. Fifty-five. 
I equals one, sorry. Tad, I meant to say Tad, I don't know why I said 15. I definitely was like looking at, oh, it's good. Oh, because the summation value is still. Yeah, because you, you're just signing it. So that would, be, that would be the same as doing like, really, J equals one, you know, J. That'd be, that would be the sum of one, not I. Yeah, so. Good questions, I like it. But let's just make sure that's still doing its thing. So there's a convenient syntax if you just want to index some, or sorry, um, iterate something to one, um, or iterate something, or add a number to an existing number, so an existing variable, this plus equal syntax. It's the exact same thing as doing this right here. So I'll run this, and it gives you the exact same result. Plus equal is the same as the Yeah. Okay. It's, it's the same as taking the val value equals value plus i is the same thing as value plus equals i. But when I do i, when I make i to the 22, it gives me a massive negative number. That's because you... That number is bigger than the so normal it number, it, so it, f it resets through because you've used too many bits. So it flips the sign bit, and then the, we're getting into land of, remember that where I said we don't want to talk about computers work? That is the too far into how computers work. You got a bad answer because you made a bigger number than the normal number is allowed to. How, how big can it I don't know what the, well, it can go very, very big depending on what type of number you use. So we're using the out of the box by integer there, which is probably an int 32 or 64. So that's 32 bits, which is two to the 32nd or 32nd minus one. We're getting too far into how computers work. If you'd like a, I will send you an article on how, how, uh, numerical numbers are, uh, rep numerical values are represented in binary. But I don't really want to dust off my computer science degree today, so let's not do that. Vi <laughs> so while loops, so we can do pretty much the exact same thing with a different kind of loop, and we'll we'll see different ways of doing things with different kinds of loops. They're all resulting in the same thing, and it might be a little annoying to see them all doing this right away at, up front. But all of them have different uses, so it, it's just good to see what each loop does, how you would do the same thing. What you want to do is pick the type of loop that makes you have the least amount of code. So like if you're just doing something over a range, you wouldn't want to use a while loop. Um, but we'll see shortly in a place where you would want to see it. Would you want to use a while loop as opposed to a for loop? Because a for loop would require you to do more code. We'll get there. But anyway, so what we're doing here is, like we were talking about with modifying i, this time we're leaving i as it is. So how a while loop is, while this Boolean condition is true, and we'll check it every time we go through the loop, as even the first instance. Um, so we'll start with this. So while i is less than 10, less than or equal to 10, um, do that thing that we did before, add, add the new index to our summation value. And then we're also going to iterate. So we're going to plus equal i, I plus equal 1. So we're going to increment i to the next value where the for loop was using a range to do that for us we have to do that by ourselves and you would want to make sure that you do this as the for this kind of loop you would want to do i plus equals one at the end or you would end up doing it one step earlier than you normally do um, there are times where you might want to do that um, there's other times where that will cause errors so this would be one of those times where you would get an error um, let's go ahead and run this. So our final value, 55, as it was before. If we were to move this up to the top, we will get a different number. Apparently it's 66. I couldn't have told you what that number was off the top of my head mathematically. Um, but this is what you want to do. So, and so one of the things, the powerful things you could do with this is maybe I got passed into you or was some sort of mathematical result. And maybe it started at 11. And you're, if you got 11, you don't need to do anything. So you end up with summation value equals zero. Probably a weird, like not actually what you would ever do, but something like this can be useful. So you don't ever go into the while loop because it's blocked by that first. That'd be like wrapping it in a an if, your for loop in an if statement of is this less than, it, than that. So go ahead. Is there a place where Julia saves all the variables, like a workspace? 
so that you can access and see what variables are saved as what value? Yes, let's do that later when we're doing deep. I'm going to show you how to use a debugger. I don't know how it works on here. I'd have to figure it out. It's this thing. I haven't figured out how to get debugging working quite on here, but we'll, we'll um, I think you have to use it in a file, but yes, and we, I will show you how to do that by the end of the lecture. So what if we're in a while loop and we like programmed it poorly and it's just infinitely looping? And then it will, it will just go on for, that is called what's called an infinite loop. Yeah, so how do we break it though? That's my question. If it's in, so like if, here, here's an, okay, here's another re way you might use a while loop. You can actually just do while true, which I think that's supposed to be, is that lowercase? I don't remember if it's lowercase or uppercase. While one equals one, um, and then, so if I percent 54 equals zero, I don't know, I'm just doing some absolute random thing. You can then do what's called break, and then that will um, eventually, so that will kick you out of the loop once this condition is. So sometimes you will do an infinite while loop. But otherwise I would just hit that stop yeah. button. Mm -hmm. and that would oh, is that you were more talking practically speaking? Yeah, practically speaking. I yes, you would hit a, you hit the like stop button. Board. Yes, you hit the stop button. <laughs> we learned a thing. It wasn't the thing you were asking about, but this is a this is a thing you might sometimes do. Well. Yeah, so there's break um, in. So while we're on the topic, um, if I equal equal four and continue. So continue jumps you to the next part of the loop. So this would be the series, the sum i equals 1 not equal 4 to 10. Um, this is when it finds i is equal to 4. Well, I'd have to move this down to there, actually. But that would then, it kicks you out of the loop. So we'll get a different value that time. So 55 minus 4, 51. And one technique that we use, uh, at least in that lab, to of prevent having infinite loops is to use a Boolean statement and the false statement to say, like, well, this is true and it's also less than this. Yes, you're going to see one of those later. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What you're talking about is something like, so while, what was this? I less than equal to 10. Uh, well, this is the, it would be like we would have some other statement over here. Yeah. And. Yeah, yeah. True. And it's less than. 10. Yeah, you're going to see this. I'm going to do less than um, when we're doing series. There will be a less than 20 because I didn't want to do thousands of things. Okay, we'll go ahead and get rid of that because that's not going to actually work. Let's get rid of that. There we are. And get rid of that. Uh, why are you not working? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> because it's carrying over from the last time. So if you don't initialize i, does, it just, does the program assume that it's zero? When the first time you write it, you, no, this would, it, it shouldn't, comp so if we change this to j, mm -hmm. this shouldn't, this should throw an error because the variable doesn't exist. Okay. Yeah, j not defined. So now let's do i equals 5 to 11 i. So what do we, we'll write it up here. What do we think we need to change up here to make this series happen? And 10 less than 11. So you get 56. So I, I wrote this out in two different ways. So I did the for loop and the while loop versions of this. But yeah, you're exactly right. i equals 5 less than or equal to 11. Ooh. And then if you want to run that, you can copy and paste it down here. Um, for some reason, I have this as 7 to 11. This is supposed to, certainly supposed to be 5 to 11 here. I don't know why that's a, five, a 7. Yeah, in the solution, I accidentally, I have a typo. Uh, I have a 7 instead of a 5 which I will definitely go in correct because that will definitely confuse somebody that's reading through it because that would be like 
but it's not the same and I'm getting a different result. That's because it's not the same and you should be getting a different result. All right, so let's do something to um, kind of combine some of the stuff we were doing before with what we're doing now. So we want to print out the first five even numbers. Um, so how you do that is, so this is the first kind of naive way of doing it. So we know that we want five numbers. So how many even numbers are in the first, or how many numbers would it take to get to the fifth even number? It's 10 numbers, because um, there's going to be five odd numbers as well. Um, so you can loop through the first 10. It might actually be nine. I, again, this was the naive way of doing it. I didn't think about it through it too much, but this will get you it there because it's going to get you two through ten. Oh yeah. Um, we'll get to why that statement was confusing in my head down in a little bit. Um, but what this is doing is it's looping ten times and checking if the index is divisible by two. Um, is then giving you two, four, six, eight, ten, and then we're printing out the number if that's the case. And if not, we're just going back to the end of the loop. Um, the alternative way of doing this would be if we were doing odd numbers, we could get the odd numbers, or if we wanted to, this is actually a better, usually a better way of writing your code. It's not as applicable in this example because there's not a lot of code, but oftentimes you want to have your main code of the thing you're trying to do in the least indented part of the code, um, just to be clear about what's suppo like supposed to happen. I mean, all of the code is supposed to happen if you've written it correctly for the state, but like the main thing that's happening is that we're printing when it's even. So you continue when it's odd, and you actually print when it's even. Um, sometimes the code doesn't lend itself to be able to do that, but this is probably a better general practice if you were doing something like this. Um, here's a smarter way of doing it. Um, we've got five numbers, and we can multiply the index by two and get that same result. So there's a lot of ways to do various things. Um, kind of, there's always more than one way to do anything in code. There's better ways, there's faster ways. Some ways you are choosing style over um, maybe speed, or sometimes both are the same. Um, simplicity. Um, like this is very declarative of what you're trying to do, but this is also pretty simple to read as well. Um, there is yet another way of doing this with a while loop. So while less than five, check if it's even if it's even, check that you've, so we're gonna, as we're going through this, we're counting how many evens we've found, and every time we'll go through and eventually we'll hit five and that, then we'll stop. Um, this time we're getting zero in there, so we probably should have started with one and used less than, but different thing, similar, similar result. There was a sort of a bug in that one, but, um, did a slightly different thing. So zero is an even number? Zero, I think, is technically an even number. My pure math is bad, so let's just pretend that that doesn't matter. Um, maybe you wanted zero, maybe you didn't want zero. Um, I'm going to go with, because it's divisible by two, give zero is even. So we're going to go with that is even. So all of this, we did very simple things, um, but you can do anything inside, you can write any kind of code you want inside of a loop. My suggestion is you should keep it to a minimum, how much is in any individual loop. You don't want to have like a for loop and then like 5,000 lines of code and then the end of the loop, because it's hard to see where you are in the code. If that's the case, you should be breaking that out into smaller functions and you can call functions from inside the loop. So doing a very similar thing to what we were doing before but this is the whole thing changed out into a function. So we moved out our print statement into a function. We pass in the index and the value at that point. And then inside of our for loop, we do the same thing, but instead of printing it ourselves, we call off the print function. Again, this is a really trivial example because we've moved, we've now actually added code by having a function. Um, there's three more lines, two, at least two more lines of code than there would have been before because we've 
added a, a function declaration, um, but you can imagine that if there was a function that needed 50 lines of code to print it out the way we wanted to, you would want to have that in its own function. So is it just a coincidence that the, the print iteration message calls on i and then the summation value, and then it's also summation value in the function handle? Um, I just used the exact same names, but you could change this yeah. so index. Change the summation value to something else like total. Yeah, just value, you could call it, because you're just printing it. It would, yeah. So that's a good question. So that's about, so that has to do with what would be called scoping. So when you're in this part of the code, you're in the scope of the for loop. So you might have initialized a variable equals here. If this language works the way I think it should work, this should throw an error the J. Okay, so Python does, or Julia doesn't do scoping the way other languages do. But in other languages, if you declared something inside of a for loop, it wouldn't be available to you outside the for loop. Um, and this might just have to do with the fact that we're in Jupyter, and Jupyter does weird things. Um, but in general, you wouldn't want to do this because you don't know necessarily that you're going to go into a for loop or into a, I guess, a while loop you might jump out of and never declare the variable. And I actually did this wrong. I wanted to do print j, so maybe it will do what I'm thinking now. No. Yeah, five final value. It, print j before. it worked. Yeah. Whatever. Don't do what I just did there. Whether or not Julia will allow you to do it, you don't want to do that. You would want to declare j up here and do whatever you need to do with j in the loop and then use j at the end. Um, but the scoping of, so if I tried to use index f here instead of i, it would not work or it should not work. Um, you use the, the variables that are scoped to where you are. Um, this is likely because we're in a Jupyter notebook and Jupyter just throws everything into what would be called a global variable. And in general, in real code, you do not want to use global variables for many reasons that would go into a bunch of software engineering stuff that we don't want to dive too deep into yet, but I would nerd out for 45 minutes talking about. Any questions so far? Cool. Arrays. So let's talk about arrays. What arrays are at the end of the day is just a list of things. Um, in a computer, they're just spaces of memory where we can keep things and they're collected together. Um, each spot, you, the computer knows how to get to the, the first one and the second one and the third one and the fourth one. In math, we call that a vector. And in Julia, they actually usually call these vectors as well when I um, print this. So I'm actually using what's called the display function. So display gives some fancier, um, more information about it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to initialize you know, what we could call the origin of space, 0, 0, 0, corresponding to x, y, and z. Display that point. And then you can do all of the normal kind of vector math that you would normally do. You can add, subtract, dot product, those kinds of things with vectors, um, and print it. So run this. So we created a three-element vector. There's your answer. Uh, it's 64-bit integers is the default. Um, 0, 0, 0, and then we added the other vector that we defined here. So when you add 0 to anything, it's going to just give you basically that same thing back. The display function did all this nice, fancy printing for us. Um, you can do what's called an element-wise operation. So what that does is take at any given index, it's going to do that operation um, with the corresponding number or this corresponding index in the other one. So what this is doing is one times two, two times two, three times two. Um, and then giving you a vector with those values in it. Um, so this, these two things were equivalent doing two because it was, they were all twos. So it would be the same thing as doing and, and you can that's what you can you can also do that you can do we could do that we could do kind of any numbery kind of thing that you would think intuitively you can do so this is like scaling the vector by 2.1 times um, and 
of course we don't have to limit ourselves to in sizes of three you know in science type things spaces you know but you might have a four vector force um, a vector with time in it or some other variable um, there are arbitrary lengths so um, here I've got a um, a longer vector there um, and then there's a way to grab out a specific value um, and that syntax is this um, square brackets and then you put a number inside of it and it will give so value sub 1 is going to give you 10 um, I'll just go ahead and run this so what sum of two the first two terms so the long vector give me the first one and the long vector give me the second one and then it's going to add those together and that results in 13.23 so 12.23 plus 1 side note Julia uses what's called one base indexing. I don't remember what MATLAB does. Maybe other programming languages you've used does what's a zero based indexing. So in, I would say 95% of languages, if not more, the way you would do that would have been values sub zero. And that was why in my head earlier, I was like, is it 10 numbers? Is it nine? Because most of the time you work in zero indexing, you start from zero and go through. Um, but Julia, to make things Simpler to, um, I don't know who, they just decided that one based indexing. There are other languages that do it. I'm not a fan because kind of my note here is that you'll see algorithms written out or other code written out out in the world that almost is invariably written in zero based indexing. So if you're trying to convert an algorithm or code that you've seen in another language to Julia, you got to make sure that you're doing the indexing correctly. You might have to decrement like because the, the algorithm might be built in such a way that you can't actually use zero, you know, your index starting at zero. You actually have to index it at, or at one, you have to start it at zero. So you have to do plus one, uh, index plus one, whenever you're doing the, um, inter, um, the array lookup. So be aware of that. Watch out for it. Do, do, do. So one thing you will find yourself doing all the time is once you have vectors, you're going to want to loop over those vectors, over those arrays, and get the values of those things. So what I did here is do a very simple implementation of the dot product. And what the dot product is, is the sum of um, a sub i times b sub i. I should have written that in a sum, but you got the example here. You guys have all done a dot product before, I assume. Um, what? Nice, <laughs> right on, right on schedule. I tried to keep the, all these modules in lockstep or slightly behind the the math chapters, um, but so we'll go ahead and run through this. So we've got our function dot product, which you take in one vector and another vector. Um, start with a value of zero for your initial sum value um, for one in length, and I did not introduce this function. I introduce it right down here, but um, you have to go through the length of the vector, and Julia provides you the function out of the box called length that will give you the length of a vector. Um, so this is going to give you three. So for one in three, for the what we pass in, um, get the the value from the first from the if in index the if index for the second one, multiply those two things together to give you our new term, and then plus equal that into our product, and la-di-da, with defining and then calling it, we get negative 14 for when we do one, two, and three. Um, maybe the easiest way to see this as well would be one, 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 which will give you three. negative 14. Any questions there? Or does that all make sense? That's exactly what you would be doing on paper and pencil math, grabbing them, putting them on your paper, adding them together. Um, this, is faster. this is faster. This is less error prone. Use, learn how to do the mathematical concepts once, do it on paper once for a si nice sized thing, like a three by three matrix or a you know, three and three vector, and then never do it on paper ever again. I mean, other than when you have to do it on a test.
Will uh, Juliet find the solution back to her? Uh, the eigenvalue, yeah, that's... Uh, what we're going to do that. Yeah, that's... Uh, How long does it take it to do 5,000 by 5,000? Uh, I don't know. I have no idea. We'll find out. Uh, uh, now that you've said that, I'll put in the. I haven't written that lecture yet. I will see if we can make that happen. Because we did that today with like a five thousand by five thousand matrix and numerical methods. Yeah. It took like seventeen seconds. If you just yeah. Did like the a backslash b. Yeah. But then you can do like Gaussian elimination. Or There's all sorts of. Oh yeah. Julia is very good at that stuff. Um. So two things here. So what's one thing that could potentially go wrong with this function, the, the way it's written? I'll get rid of that so you can't see it. What it it's allowing me to pass any. Well, it's actually allowing me to pass anything into those two. Oh, the vectors aren't the same length. What if the vectors aren't the same length exactly? So there are a couple of things you can do in Julia to make sure that that happens. Um, there's a thing called a macro. So if you ever see anything that's got an at in front of it, that's what's called a macro. And it's doing, it's basically like, a, it's a fancy function call, um, but it's just a one line thing. Um, so what this is doing is, if this thing is not true, it will print out an error message, which is what's going to happen here. Um, and we already talked about the, the length function. Um, so here I have, you know, and then it gives you assertion error length vector one. So it's printing out the code that you have. So this is a thing. Um, where it, why it's good to use method names that actually make sense because that's super readable. Like, because I named my thing vector one and vector two, like it's telling you can almost read that as a, a an English sentence. Like the length of vector one is, you know, equal equal length like vector two. Let's say that there's an error in that. Um, so, and then fix that. How am I going to fix that? And Either get rid of the four at the end of vector B, or you can add another. That sounds like fun. Let's do that. I got a dot product value not defined. Uh, yeah, I changed something in here, and I. Yeah, it's probably. Yeah, I know what happened. This was. I was. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Equals one. There we go. Um, I changed. What I had originally, so this was a good learning experience. I, in here, I had written some, I named this function dot product, and then down below, I used dot product as a variable, and it threw an error because it, I tried to rename a function into a variable, which it did not like. Um, so, you gotta use different names for everything. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? Um, so, I will make sure to get that typo um, tonight. Well, I have to go back into the <laughs> into the repository and actually change it and push it up so everybody has it. But no, no, no. The, there's supposed to be parts where I make you work. It's not figuring out the, why the lecture code isn't working. <laughs> that is not what we're trying to do here. Um, so now we've got what's called the, a using keyword. Um, so Julia and many, you know, almost all languages kind of have their standard library, their built-in library. So everything that you are doing and using so far has been using ooh, using essentially base. So base is the, um, some languages call it a module, some call it a namespace. Essentially, it's a grouping of code that's all together. Um, so. You don't have to ask for base. Julia is always providing you base because it's the stuff you're going to always need for loops, while loops, um, addition, subtraction, that kind of stuff. Um, but there are a lot of other libraries in the standard library. And then there are libraries that other people have built that you can import, which we'll talk about in another lecture. Um, um, but this is then importing the, li the linear algebra function functionality. So this is the, the name of that um, module or um, library. And so once we have that, we can use, um, there are a lot of different functions, but one of them that we can use is the dot product, which is just called dot. So that will then give us that same, well, we used a different um, set of numbers, but that gives us the dot product of those two vectors. So in general, um, use the standard libraries, use the built-in functionality. You don't want to write your own dot product because they, 
A, have tested it a lot more, B, have probably done very fancy things to you to make it go faster with big matrices and big vectors and all that kind of stuff. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. I believe I've said that at least three times so far um, during these lectures. Uh, da, 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 da. Moving forward, uh, one nice um, function that you have is if you know how big of an array vector you're going to use, you can start um, and just build up it at the beginning and say, hey, let's initialize um, a, a, a vector of size 100 all with the zeros. Um, so that's what that's doing. And what we're going to do here is um, build up a 200 length vectors, one with the first um, 100 powers of 2, um, not including 0, um, and then the first uh, 100 powers of 4, not including to the zero. So to use any of these functions, like the zeros function or the dot product function, you always have to put the using linear algebra line in front of it? I can, it's not direct, one, it's not directly in front of it, but at the top of the file. So using statements always, I have that written in here, I just forgot to say it. Um, using statements are at the top of the file, and then you can start using it. Okay. You shouldn't like start, like if the first place you're going to use it is down here, like don't do linear I like don't do I, don't, I that either won't work or would be a bad way to do it. So like, define it at the beginning of the file, regardless of how you're when you're going to use it. So every time you're going to make a new file, you would just throw in at the, the top, like yep. using linear algebra, using statistics. Yep. Using yeah, whatever, whatever you're going to use. So we'll go ahead and run this. So a very big number. And is linear algebra just the name of the built-in libraries? Yes. Are there, other there are a lot of other statistics, math. Probably rant. There's a whole ton. So the, the that Julio that Julie, there's probably things that do. Yeah, there, there are libraries that do calculus and integrals and that kind of stuff, which we will get to at some point probably. Um, do do do. Yeah. So note on all that. So there are. So this is linear algebra. There's math. There's statistics. There's all. So I'll just go ahead and open that page just so we have it. Um, so you can. There's all sorts of. So there's these. Let's see what another one that might be eventually useful. Logging. Unit testing. So that's one that's coming up later. Um, you can search. So let's think. What's a mathematical concept that we haven't talked about before in, the, in these programming things? Let's see if any of them come up. Base dot derivative. So in that's in base math. That's divide. <laughs> nice try, Jackson. Uh, this might be a symbolics. Yeah, this is an outside library. I might try to do this at some point at the end of the lecture because this stuff is so cool and so powerful. It will do mathematical stuff for you so like it'll simplify algebraic expressions and do derivatives and stuff when i saw this so i first saw this in um, mathematica was the first language that i did that in um, i was like between that and doing um like iterative methods to solve like um what you call it like when you have a equation with two two very two ver or three functions or two unknowns when you have the wrong ratio of that where you do a numerical method it's like, cool, I don't actually have to do math anymore. Computers will do the math for me. It was a great day. All right, let's, so here's a couple of them. So you've got various functions that come in from stats or linear algebra. So we've got dot product, median, mean, sum. So these three came from stats. This one came from linear algebra. We can run that and get the average value and the sum and all that kind of fancy stuff. So again, don't reinvent the wheel. Go find the the built-in function to do it. Having said that, we're going to reinvent some wheels. <laughs> I need a, another quick sip of a drink. So we are going to explore. So in uh, in one of our math chapters, we talked we talked about series, especially like series expansions of functions, which you probably come up come across in calculus, but. This is where you can start to really see it happening because you don't have to do. It's like I wonder how how many how many of these terms I really actually need. 
do I need 10? Do I need 100? Do I need 1,000? You're not going to do that on paper. And people did back in the day. They would sit there and they would just do it until it got to the, the, the small enough value. Thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore. Um, so e to the x, the series expansion of that is x to the n to the n over n factorial, um, which starts as 1, then x, x squared over 2, x squared over 3, off to infinity, and eventually that converges to the exact value of e to the x in the infinite limit. Um, so out of the box mathematics, we have the fa factorial function. Um, uh, da, 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 da. So you don't have to implement your own factorial function, which would be not that hard to implement because it's just a, another loop and be in, if you want to go try to do it. I remember that was, I think, was one of my programming assignments in undergrad was to implement a factorial function with a loop. Um, but we won't do that because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So we have a, a function here that is calculating each term. And so we can, you know, do for e to the e to the e to the second power, get the first, second, and third. Yeah, go ahead. What is the return line doing again, or just the phrase return? Yeah, return for a function. And I should have put here probably float 64. This return function for a function. So all the functions where we didn't actually, where we were just printing stuff, that's what's called a void function, where it doesn't return a value. You could, let's go up to one of these, actually. You can equally, at the end of one of these functions, oh, return, we did it here. It returns the value. Let's find one where it was void. Sorry. Yeah. You could equally return, essentially return nothing. So return is saying we're just returning a void value and nothing value. And, you know, when I call the function, I can't do A equals. Well, I shouldn't be able to do that. I wonder what. Nothing. So I guess Julia is smart enough to deal with nothing, but in other languages that wouldn't work. I don't know why you would need to ever use if something came back as nothing, but you can do a lot of really generic stuff. Long-winded way of saying re the return thing is at a specified point in a function, returning the value that comes to the right of it to the caller of the function. So this code down here is where we're calling it. So that's why we print two 2 and 1.3 is because this function, when we passed in 2, 1, gave us 2 back and we printed 2. So we've wrapped functions and functions, like I've said before. So it evaluates that function, gives us the value of 2. So that's our third term. We could then do a fourth term if we wanted to by a copy and paste, which bad, never do that. But as you can see, the values are getting smaller, which, you know, that means that we're trending towards convergence. So instead of doing that, wouldn't you know it, we're going to use a loop. So uh, walking through this, so we have that same function as before, um, and we're going to call it in our loop. The way we're going to do it is so setting up our, so we're going to have a series expansion value. So we're going to cumulatively keep track of the value. Um, because I used n in the um, summation, I used n as the iteration variable. Again, you can use whatever variable you want as iteration. Uh, I grabbed the exact value. So again, math gives us exp to the x. So um, whatever value got passed in, we'll give our exact exp to that power. Um, and then we'll also cal calculate it as a series. So we'll go through until n is um, greater than 20. I guess once it's equal to 20, it'll stop. Um, it's going to calculate x, so that x came from here, so that whatever the caller came asked for, we'll continue using that x. We'll calculate that at that nth term, series turn n. We will add it to our sum total summation, and then we will increment by 1. We'll go through the loop 20 times, and then we will print how many iterations we did, and then we will return our value. So we did 20 iterations and we got a value of 7.3. Um, 
this is a vestige of earlier code. This doesn't actually need to be there. Um, I didn't print it out. We'll use it here down in a second. I broke, when I first wrote this, I wrote it all as one function. And then I was like, people are going to get confused. I should probably break this out and build it up as we go. Um, so what am I doing here? Um, so now we're doing convergence. Um, what we're also going to do is check, hey, if the, con while it's big, the, the next term that we just did is greater than 0 0.01, we'll keep going and we'll only do 20 iterations. But if we got to a term that's smaller than that before 20, we'll stop, which is exactly what happened. So we do nine iterations. So after nine iterations, the newest value was less than or equal to 0 0.01. So we stopped because we've gotten to, for what we've defined as good enough for convergence, you could also do you know, a much smaller value and it's going to go another number and if we want to add another zero it might take another iteration so as we make our what we define as convergence how small our next term can be smaller it's going to take more and more um, times through the loop more um, whatever uh, you know what the word I'm looking for is but I can't place it number of indexes a number of terms to get to what we have defined as convergence. Undo all of that. Any questions on that? I know I kind of jumped through the code. I was just jumping into the thing that it actually changed. Cool. Moving forward. Um, so here's a final version. Um, so we're actually comparing it to the only real difference is that um, it compares it to it. And uh, we're doing some rounding here. Don't worry too much about what's all is going in here. I just wanted this to look a little prettier. Um, I explained above what the functions are. Um, one of the, so you were talking about um, numbers being too big. You can wrap in a, a, a number in a big keyword and it gives you a lot more digits. So if I get rid of this rounding, I'll run it. Oh, it's already run. So no, I run, rounded it so it's nice and pretty. So we, you know, we converge to 0 0.01 like we, we said like the first 0 0.01 terms are um, the same, but then afterwards it's not. So if we were to change that to 0 0.001, we should get closer. I don't know why that, that's either rounding or, but as we change that, we go farther and farther down the list of numbers that are the same change this to a thousand just to, as an arbitrary number you could make this ten thousand it would still work um, but that's just kind of a block to make sure that you don't end up in some sort of infinite loop um, put all this back um, I do want to show what happens when you don't round so this because I wrapped this in that big number this is going to have a ton of digits <laughs> available to us. I don't know how many that is, but it's a lot. Um, and that's the thing with floats. So, so again, let's do this to the fifth power. So it's, it's the same number of digits that were allowed. It just um, moved where the decimal point is. And again, it actually has to do within the computer the number of um, binary digits that you have, but it corresponds to a similar number of 10 base digits. All right, any questions there? Makes sense. Cool. Haven't lost anybody. It's great. So we also have the cosine and sine functions, which have pretty similar-ish kind of summation um, representations, series expansions. Um, so the difference is that you start with a negative one to the n to give you that f flipping every term plus or minus x to the two n and two to the n fa or fa two n factorial. Um, so that seems wrong. I feel like that. I copied and pasted that from somewhere, so it's got to be right. Just my brain's not working. Um, it looks right. Yeah, it's right. Um, got 7, 8 p.m. brain at the moment. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of this. The only things that have changed here, really, 
is this function. So all this code to calculate a series is exactly the same. We took in an x value, which is you know, our cosine x instead of e x p x, e to the power of x. And then the code that we're using to compare. So after 11 iterations, we're pretty close to the expected of cosine of 2 pi is 1. Um, so for your homework, you're going to do the sine function, which I have some of the code laid out, but you can probably see how the code that you're going to need to change. It's probably just this one line of code to then match this expression instead of this expression. So it should be a pretty easy homework assignment. Go ahead. Can you clarify what the big function is doing inside of the factorial function? Yeah. Um, mathematically, if you're just thinking in terms of not computers, this is the same thing. Big just so if you went to factorial n. So think of how many terms that that's doing. Um, Julia has a specialized way of handling when n is big for doing factorials. Um, it's not going to give an exact value. It uses some fan, like some mathematical estimation of factorial um, that's pretty close for big um, numbers. This I basically put it in there um, so that the code didn't break when the iterations went high. When I wrote it the first time, I wrote it like this, and then it threw. A, threw a, um, a fit at me when I went to, you know, index 1500 and I was like, oh, okay, I'll just wrap it in this because apparently that's how you fix this error message. So let's run that. Um, let's, and then get rid of this. Overflow 22 is too large to, for, a, so that's, so, so it told, actually in the error message told me what to do. So for factorial of a regular number, Julia just has a lookup table, so it has an array in, in memory where it just knows how to look up the values, but it didn't do anything above 22 because that number is pretty big. Um, so that's why that's there. <laughs> the real reason it's there is because that error message told me to put it there. So that's a good <laughs> segue into how debugging works. Um, cool. So that is our module for this week. Um, there's one last thing to um, talk through, which is how to do your homework assignments. Um, and we might go a little bit over this time. Is that OK? You guys have time? OK, cool. Because I only went like 45 minutes last time, so I'm kind of taking back some of that 15 minutes. Anyway, so I have built out these exercise files and uh, unit test files. So what a unit test is, is it calls code with some input values and then knows what the value is supposed to be and compares those, what the result should be, and then we can, um, it'll say true or false whether the pa test passed. Um, so I'll show you how those work um, here in a second. When you're submitting them, so just grab all of your exercise files. So for this module, you'll have module two exercise one dot JL, which is the Julia um, post whatever extension. Um, so there's this one, this one, and this one. Don't change the file names. Um, just put them in a folder with your last name, first name, the module, and then which module, and then exercise, um, and then zip that, and then submit that zip file. Because um, what I'm going to do is I just will put everybody's files into one big thing, and then I'm going to write a script that's going to run all the tests on all of them, and it prints out your name so I can grade really fast. Um, power of programming. Don't grade by hand. Um, and I'll still I'll be looking through just to make sure that people kind of got the concepts, but it helps me find who might not have gotten some things right. Um, although I did put a caveat at the end. If all your pa pa tests don't pass, you, can't, you don't get credit for the module. So if you can't figure something out, email me. I will help you. We will get you through to the end of them. These are, these are too tough. And I'm going to send out hints if, throughout the week um, towards the end of the... Uh, the due date that should help people. Um, so I built one of these first ones, so just a hello world of the, the kind of things. So each exercise file, I'm going to scaffold out what functions I want you to do. So at this point, you guys don't need to think about, like, I don't really want you guys thinking about how to lay out my code and what the functions are going to be. I just kind of want you implementing some of the functions. Eventually, I'll have you build your own thing. I'll say, hey, there's a, I'll give you the definitions, and it'll be, you'll get hints by how the the, the unit tests are set up to kind of show you how you should build it, but I'm not going to build the function for you, so we'll build towards that. So 
in, in these modules, you just there'll be functions, and some of them, you know, the function might not be implemented all the way. In every single one, and at the top, you're going to have, you know, get some. It's a, a getter to get the string that has your name. So just in all of them, put your name here. This is for that automated grader, so I can see your name above your uh, above your output results. Um, and then, so we just have a couple functions to find, hello and hello that takes in a name. Um, so this is called function overloading. So you can have two things that are the same name, but depending on the parameters that are given, it'll, it'll Julia will decide which one of these functions to use. Um, and then I have a test runner that, um, so using, like we were using linear algebra, I'm using the test module. Um, and I'm also including the hello.jl um, so this is a relative path because I'm in the same directory. It knows to just go to the same one. If it was something in the directory above, I could go like that and do the dot dot. Um, but again, all this kind of stuff I'll have already set up for you guys. I'm not going to make you guys do any of that setup. Um, so it's going to call hello and get the text. And then it's going to test whether hello is equal equal um, hello. Test sets are just chunks of tests that are all together so i could you know test not equal to blank or something like that would be another test i could write in there so test sets i can have multiple tests they're all named together um, and then i called it with my name and it should print out hello my name so going back to this so in here you can write in a snippet um, Include the file you want to include, call the function you want to call, and then print it. So this printed hello. So hello world was out in our other file. Test runner, um, like I already showed you that um, in the file itself, but you could have done the same thing here. Write, write some tests. Um, this is what happens when a test fails. It gives you an output message and hopefully gives you, sometimes it doesn't give you as useful of a thing, but it should somewhere, if you dig around in these error messages, find which test didn't pass. Um, and, you know, so it evaluated that, you know, this didn't that. Uh, somewhere as, and it gives you the, this is the line, it should be the line of the file right there. So if I go to test runner, Oh, so in this thing, this is the fifth line in this thing. So that's where the test that failed was, was on the fifth line. This is more descriptive when it's in a um, error message file because it will say the file name and then, because this is the input 80, so that's what this thing was because we're in Jupiter land, and then the fifth line. It tells you that some didn't pass, um, and we could... <laughs> well, that took way too much thought <laughs> to figure out how to make that pass. So that's a failed test. So in the same way, you can include the test runner file and then run it. So in all of these, I when I create these, and you'll see down below, I have all the code commented out. When you see a if you see, ever see code in here in one of these notebooks that has a that's commented out to start, the only reason I did that is so that when it's building, um, no, 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 uh, I don't want to do what it just did. Um, this stuff is all using the same notebook, so it would print out all those really airy, ugly error messages, which I don't want to happen. So that's why I comment out some of the code. But if you ever, somebody got confused, or one of the TAs that I was showing the code got confused. So if you ever run into that in one of these, just uncomment it by removing the hashtag. And then, so now you can run it. So all of the tests pass. So our hello tests pass. Yeah, go ahead. Is there a quick command for removing comments? What? Is there a command for yeah, uh, control. Uh, slash. So the, the one under the question mark, comments and uncomments. And yeah, you can do that on multiple lines. So when I do that, it's and it's the same in the IDE that I'm going to show you here in five minutes. Um, so there are three problems. I'm not going to 
run through them because I kind of gave you the hint on the other one. So the sign, I kind of told you what that is. Uh, counting the even numbers in an array, that's pretty simple. So you're just going through a loop um, and printing those out. Um, it's actually, yeah, counting, not printing, counting. So you're returning a number to the calling function. And then these are building an array and then returning those. So I will open up this. So in this, um, you're going to return an array that has the first n odd numbers. And this one, you're going to return the first n number of powers of three, not added together, just in an array. So, and then the tests, it's showing, and you can see, you can peek at the test and kind of see what your results should be. So, one, three, five, when I pass in five. So, that's that. Um, so, I will uncomment out one of these. Oh, so this is just calling the code. And if you want to, if you're working in Jupyter, you can add a snippet. I believe it's with this button. Yeah, you can add snippets. You can start do if you want to, you know, leave that one, but you want to make another one. It's this plus button right here. Okay. It's the add. And there's probably, if you right click, you can probably, you could also, you know, copy the cell and then paste cell below, that kind of thing. So. But then, so this is where these are the tests that need to pass. So these fail because it hasn't been implemented yet, and these fail because it hasn't been implemented yet. So this is where the, the test files are run. In here, you can also open up a test runner file. Sorry, I want to make sure I didn't. Did that make sense, what I did there of including this? I'm going to clear all of the outputs. Um, so I had them commented out. These are the tests that need to pass. So for your, to get the points. Um, and then there's, there's A and B. So I have a, them broken out as A and B. And then problem two and three just have one problem. And then they're linked. So if you're in Jupyter or in the IDE, you can click this link button and it will open up the corresponding. It sh should. Nope, doesn't work in that apparently. I swore this worked before. Anyway, well, it tells you what it is. If you're working in Visual Studio Code, it opens up the file for you. Um, but there's the file. There's the other one. Oop. Um, and then, if, like I was saying with the test runners, so opening up a test runner, you can create a console and you're going to want to pick. Julia. I don't know why the kernel's not working. And then you can, if you copy path and then do dot slash, that should, maybe it's not that. It is include. Nope, I haven't figured out how to make this work. I thought I had it working before. Just use the use the um, the stuff in the um, what you call it um, notebook file. It'll make your life easier. Um, that being said, um, two thoughts before we go. One, I didn't mention this before and should have. Julia knows how to deal with complex numbers. Um, so this will do exactly what you would expect, all the addition and stuff. Um, it's somehow disconnected. And here are the many reasons why you don't want to use um, Jupyter Book forever, because sometimes you get disconnected from the kernel, and you have to start all over in terms of running everything. Um, and so we'll talk about the virtues of using a IDE. An IDE is an integrated development environment. So I will go ahead and switch over to